as for the mindset thing, it's definitely a, you know, a limiting belief when I started out that, you know, I shouldn't really be here. I was always really uncomfortable, especially when I was sh- shopping for a building with a realtor right. manager. And I was like, you know, I was my first year university. I didn't really feel confident in that. Welcome to the Golden Nuggets of Real Estate Investing, a podcast dedicated to helping you achieve financial freedom through real estate. We'll be discussing the most important lessons or better known as the Golden Nuggets of Real Estate Investing, entrepreneurship, and personal finance with new and experienced investors to help you get into real estate investing or scale up your portfolio. So make sure to tune in. What's going on everyone? It's Ross Nadai. I'm a real estate agent, an investor, and host of the Real Estate Golden Nuggets podcast. I have an amazing episode full of Golden Nuggets for you. If you like this podcast and gotten any value out of it, please share this far and wide to reach as many people as possible. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave me a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, leave me a comment, like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so that you can stay up to date on the most recent episodes. Thank you so much for your support. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Real Estate Golden Nuggets. Today, I'm joined by my special guest, Jake Novis. He is an investor from Cambridge, Ontario, and he has a very unique portfolio. Thanks. I'm very excited to have him on here to tell us a little bit about his journey and what what he's been up to. So without further ado, Jake, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and how you got into real estate investing. Ross, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Big fan of the show. Um, yeah, so I started getting involved in real estate investing back when I was in high school. Um, my mother took the leap into real estate investing, looking for additional p- passive income and sources of income to build you know, financial freedom. Um, that was probably around 2012, 2013. I just started shadowing her projects um, pretty much in high school, going to monthly rain meetings, sitting there confused and not really knowing what was going on, um, <laughs> but just stuck with it, trying to learn as much as I could and learn and absorb from everybody there. Um, followed along her path on her first few properties. So some mul- or some single families um, leading into multifamilies in Hamilton. Um, a few years later, when I was going to school in Hamilton, I was uh, I basically took over the acquisition side of our, our properties. Um, so we joined Ventured on our first property in 2016. So that was uh, my first deal and it's a sixplex in Hamilton. We got for around 500,000 um, back in 2016. Yeah. So that was a large project for me. It took, you know, about a year searching for properties. Um, I learned a ton because, you know, shadowing is one thing, but really uh, searching through properties and going through the dirty properties in Hamilton uh, was was quite an experience. So started there um, over the next couple of years, kept learning and growing. We moved on to our next purchase was a nine unit in Hamilton as well. Um, basically outsourcing all management, but I was taking over the acquisition side and uh, sort of planning, you know, what renovations doing, what we're doing with those properties mm-hmm. um, throughout my education. So I actually went to school for engineering. So not, so only ever doing real estate on the side, kept learning and growing. Um, I went, I basically finished my schooling and moved out to Waterloo and uh, you know, always still learning about real estate, wanted to be more involved, decided to buy my first condo, which is my first personal residence um, to rent F8 and flip. Um, and then from there we went on and bought another six bucks in Cambridge. So that was in 2018. Um, so kind of, a, uh, you know, a multifamily property every couple of years because, you know, they are large projects and take a while to source, but, um, yeah, always just learning on the side. And then, um, as of last year, I took the leap into full-time real estate investing. I basically took over the management of our portfolio as some, as well as some of her other properties, mm-hmm. um, close portfolio to basically fill up my time and, uh, and enough salary for me to get by so that I can basically focus on real estate full time. Um, and now I've been doing this for about a year and uh, just looking to continue growing primarily in the multifamily space as well as uh, whatever else comes up in the residential side, all, um, all multifamily long-term holds and uh, value add strategies. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, you had uh, quite a bit of a head start with, with your mom being in the business, right? So definitely. Yeah, very grateful. Um, learned a ton from her. I mean, she didn't start until that year as well. So she she took a big leap from her, uh, basically her first property going into a, a six and then eight plex after that, that I kind of learned from. Yeah. Um, so very grateful to join her on her on her path and uh, done as, as best I can to pick up basically where she left off since I've taken over and uh, and just keep growing it from there and uh, learn as much as I can along the way. And, and yeah, just keep growing it. That's awesome. So is, is your mom still heavily involved or you've kind of just taken over from this point on? Um, she's primarily mentor at this point and, uh, and, um, you know, handles all the financials. So she had, had does have an accounting background. So, um, right. when we started, she was handling and still is handling a lot of the joint venture, um, 
partner structure shifts. So we both mm-hmm. pitch to investors and, and try to raise capital, but she is still handling a lot of the, uh, the financials and planning around that joint venture structures. Um, while I'm handling all the, you know, the due diligence of purchasing new properties, management, renovations, right. leasing tenants, everything on that side of things. So it's still a good combination. And, uh, and we still are basically full-time partners day to day. Um, but I'm just more on the ground and she's, uh, she's more or less on the financial and, um, JV side of things. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I love that. I love that. Like, there is a cohesiveness between you two and you guys are kind of figured out your roles and, and you guys are taking care of that, um, together now. Um, yeah, the, from what I hear, yeah, the first six pack, that's a huge jump. Was there was there a particular reason you guys went that big? Because usually it's very intimidating. A lot of people start with, say, a single family, maybe a duplex and go to go uh, gradually from that point, right? Like what kind of yeah. made you guys think, you know what, let's go with the six? <laughs> Definitely. So primarily it's for financing. So when I was in second year, you know, I had some savings. I was looking to get involved in real estate. I started looking for a student rental in Hamilton. Um, at that time, the numbers were really good for student rentals. Um, I did a number of viewings, put an offer on one. Um, but when it came to financing, um, it didn't really work out. So I was a student, didn't have any income. Um, it's not really feasible. My mother being an accountant and self-employed also, I, you know, and she wasn't looking to be on the title. It was more or less, I want to get involved myself. Um, couldn't qualify. Um, commercial lending, the beauty of it is you just need 25% net worth of the loan and, um, and uh, you can basically purchase any property as long as the property financials are work. So we can basically qualify with our joint venture partners for that loan um, as long as it's six units and up. So five units right. used to be the threshold. It's more or less six units and up now is a safe bet for anything for commercial lending. Hmm. Um, so that allowed me to then take part in those joint ventures and, uh, and get started in that way. So really... Um, to be honest, multifamily, there's a lot more to it, larger capital required and, yeah. you know, more knowledge and time, but the financing can be a lot easier and, and less headaches when you're trying to get approved. So um, that's why I still prefer multifamily. Yeah, no, for sure. I think the big, the big money really is in, in the apartment buildings. That, that's what I think. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Right. Right. Cause it's, it's easier to manage one roof versus six roofs or like, or like three roofs, right. Depending on the, um, the, I guess the quantity and the number of units and everything you have. Right. So definitely the, uh, the management side is, although it's more intensive cause there's more going on and you need right. to, you know, you need, you really need to know what you're doing. Um, right. it is easier on a per unit basis, cheaper on a per unit basis and the wealth building abilities and the net wealth multiplier of multifamily really does allow you to build more wealth in long term, anyways. So right, um, right, right. all those things work together really well. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So tell me a little bit about about uh, some of your education pieces that you you I guess took in, right? Because you said you went to some of the meetups with your with your mom and so forth. Outside of you know having her mentorship, was there anyone else you reached out to or you learned from, or what resources did you uh, you know rely on? Great question. Yeah. So I relied heavily on rain growing up. So real estate investment network for anybody that's unaware of that. So I was, um, right. you know, I was going to rain every month from probably mid high school all through, you know, first couple of years of university. I took a break during a couple of years of university when things were getting pretty tough there. And it was a little yeah. further for me to drive out to, to Pearson. Um, but rain every month and then um, just reading as much as I could. So all of Don Campbell's books, Highly recommend. Those are pretty much my guide or were my guide at that time. I know there's some others that I, I use or rely on heavily now, but um, learning, you know, what to look for in a region, what to look for in a target property, what to look for in a tenant, all those things that that Don used to preach and, um, yeah. you know, all the books on joint venture capital. So learning how to structure the deals, all those things that I was learning from my mother and she had been through, I was still making sure that I knew everything that was going on in the properties so that, you know, we're making good decisions together. And, and that I was aware that, you know, that's what, that was a good deal. We wanted to work it that way and what to do with those properties. Yeah. And so these, these properties that you guys find, were you guys working with a realtor to find these deals or were they like combination of off market and sourcing your own deals? Like, tell me a little bit about, about that. Yeah. So, when we initially started, um, we were working with a full-time realtor in Hamilton. Um, it was, everything was on market. Actually, all the multifamilies that we have were found on market. Mm. Um, back in Hamilton, when it was, I think 2016 and 18, we closed. Right. It wasn't quite as difficult as it is, has been this past year, obviously. So they were a little <laughs> more feasible at that time, as well as the property in Cambridge. Um, I think a lot of investors missed it when the listing showed what it was versus what it actually was. So the listing was really poorly done. Um, you know, six 
uh, six two bedrooms. It just said multifamily. So you'd think it's uh, apartments, but it's actually six townhomes, um, mm-hmm. which were a lot larger and nicer than the photos. So I think it was just poorly done. The seller really wasn't that motivated. It just, it was kind of weird. So all of them were actually on MLS in the past. However, um, right. I think moving forwards, we'll probably be shifting to off market multifamily properties as well as, you know, residential. Um, just because there's nothing really left on MLS that makes sense anymore. Um, unfortunately, that's kind of the way it is now. But yeah, back when we started, everything was on MLS. We had a realtor in Hamilton who knew the, knew the streets, knew the areas, and we were, you know, we relied heavily on their information. Yeah, no, that, that, that you brought a great point, and that's what I, I love about it. Uh, you know, an intelligent investor would have multiple investors in different regions that specialize in the region, right? Because one person will be, you know, really well educated on what Hamilton is. But if you tell them, hey, tell me a little bit more about Lindsay, they have no clue, right? <laughs> Everybody exactly. has their own specialties and they, they need to know their, their areas, right? So um, it's definitely good to have build a team and you can rely on. Um, so, so far you mentioned you, you guys have a property um, in, I guess, Hamilton, you said, a couple of uh, multis in Cambridge. And what, what else? Uh, are you looking at the other markets as well? Yeah, so we've got the two the two multis in Hamilton that I'm a joint venture on. Um, right. We've got the one multi in Cambridge. I have my condo in Waterloo, and I actually just recently closed on a duplex in Lindsay, which is a little further out, and looking to close on another fourplex in Lindsay uh, mid April. So a little bit of a, a switch up there. Um, yeah. The reason for that primarily is just because um, this past year has been a tough market, as I'm sure you're aware. So mm-hmm. what actually happened is um, we, my girlfriend and I, were looking for a duplex to house hack for ourselves. Um, this kind of, you know, goes off of the multifamily strategy, but we just wanted something around this area that we could house hack, uh, duplex to move into looking around the Kitchener Waterloo area. Things were a little too expensive. Started looking up in the Hamilton mountain. Things were pretty expensive, kind of looking around St. Catharines. Everything wasn't really working out how we wanted it to work. And the numbers didn't really make sense as unless we did a duplex conversion. However, that's not really my, my primary strategy. It's not my niche. Um, we didn't have the capital for it. So, we ended up finding a private seller in Lindsay who had some properties available. Um, and we really just thought, okay, well, let's take a look at these. We reached out to him. He didn't want to list on the market. He just right. wanted to work, you know, keep things quiet. We took a look at the properties, beautiful properties, large duplex for, for a reasonable price. So we went ahead with that. And, uh, and luckily he's retiring and he has more properties. So we're going to pick those up as well. So that's a awesome. different strategy there. Sounds like you hit a gold mine. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I, a lot of people would say it's luck, but I honestly just think, you know, luck is just, you know, continued hard work, meeting opportunities. So yeah, we were looking at every property in MLS for, you know, the past year before that. We went up to as far as Coba Conk up north, looking at some rundown properties, trying to make the numbers work, St. Catharines, Kitchener. Yeah. We were looking everywhere. We were telling everybody. So you really have to be active in your search. And uh, eventually, word of mouth got around that we're looking for properties. Somebody who knew the seller gave them our number. We got in touch and uh, things worked out from there. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. I, I, I truly believe that. I mean, that you create your own luck, right? You really, Definitely. really do. So in this case, like you said, if you weren't active and you weren't vocal about you know, what you're doing, uh, then people wouldn't know. Nobody would be able to reach out to you, right? So you, ne- you basically almost had like a bird dog there. <laughs> that almost, yeah. Give you a good lead. Pretty much, actually. Did you yeah. give them something back or no? <laughs> um, I haven't yet, actually. I should, though. That's a good point. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a family friend. So, or it was, sorry, it was through family. But uh, I think I'll have to. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Definitely yeah. reward that because that person is going to make you quite rich. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. So um, that's a good point, you know. Um, and just like, you know, just to reiterate, just making it vocal about what you're doing and, mm-hmm. and what you're looking for and just telling everybody it can seem kind of annoying at times, but, you know, yeah. you want your, your name to be the first that people think of when, uh, when something comes up, right? So, yeah, I don't know if you have this problem. But I do. I just can't stop talking about real estate. And it- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems to be the, <laughs> the past year. That's kind of been uh, everything that's on my mind. So, but uh, I enjoy it. So it works out as long as it doesn't bug to other people too much. <laughs> yeah. So, so in terms of financing, I guess the question comes down to, you know, there's only so much money you can make in a year, right? Given, you know, you're self-employed and so forth, right? So how are you managing, you know, the, the growing portfolio? Is it mainly JV partners? Or are you raising capital that way? Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So it's a great point. Um, you know, I really have to, uh, with the self-employed and obviously a new business, I've, I've cut back on expenses quite a bit so that I can get away with that and focus on the real estate full time. Right. Um, for the residential properties, we're, uh, we're pretty much doing that on our own. We had saved some money and um, we do have some great VTB uh, loans in there as well as some private funding that we close with. Um, however, we will be basically burning those 
paying the holding costs for the next year or so to get by um, to, and trying to pull our money back out until they cash flow. Mm-hmm. So we'll be doing those personally. Um, we all know solely and we're just looking to hold those personally. However, the multifamilies, um, I, we're only ever really going to be bringing partners in on that. Um, I don't ever fund any of the, the, the multifamily deals personally. Mm-hmm. I can't, to be honest, they, they require quite a bit of capital. Um, right. I'm just looking at managing and growing them and, and JVing um, with capital partners for those. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. So you are essentially the active partner, you bring the deal, and then you have uh, money partners that go in and you kind of manage and take over from that point on. Yep. So our, our capital partners primarily just know what we do. Um, the best partners that we've had really uh, just, you know, have full trust in what we do. We know what we're doing and our returns kind of show for it. So they trust us with their money. Um, they know it's a long term process. So we always say any joint venture partners coming in for a multifamily deal, expect a five year hold period at least until, you know, longest term until you get your money back. Right. We're working on some new strategies now that we can do that, you know, in three years or shorter. But um, we kind of say expect to be with us for five years. And, you know, those people aren't really looking for updates on the properties. Some of them don't even want to see the property. I right. make like a one page report when we close on this property to show them where their money is and what the goals are. Um, okay. But to be honest, they're not really involved with uh, with the purchase or anything really for that matter, other than just, you know, putting up the capital and then five years down the road, I'll say, here's your money back. And uh, you still own this multifamily bought property that's cash flowing. That's kind of the, the goal for that. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me something like, I'm very curious because given, given, you, you know, you're, you're fairly young yourself, right? What, did you have roadblocks where you, you were you raising capital and some people just kind of judge you based on your age and they were like, what do you mean? Like, how do you expect me to give you millions of dollars when you're like, you know, you're so young and you pro- probably don't have experience, right? Um, how, how were you able to I guess, overcome that barrier and, and still continue to, you know, raise capital? Definitely. So um, as for the mindset thing, it's definitely, a, you know, a limiting belief when I started out that, you know, I shouldn't really be here. I was always really uncomfortable, especially when I was shopping for a building with a realtor right. manager. And I was like, you know, I was my first year university. I didn't really feel confident in that. Um, I, I, you know, I've attended a couple of Tony, Ro- or a Tony Robbins event and I follow a lot of them on YouTube about breaking your limiting beliefs. Right. I think that's really important to just kind of get by that. Um, and so when I've, I've pitched to some investors and I've talked, it really took a while of, you know, amping myself before that call. Um, and the second thing I mentioned before is, you know, I, I've partnered with somebody my mother on all these properties who is more competent and honestly better at that. So, you know, we take half, we take 50% of the active partnership, but you know, I'm splitting that with her and her, her, I guess, strength is really communicating to these investors. So Mm -hmm. we've been in joint venture presentations before where, you know, I'm pitching and I'm, I'm getting it across. However, I can obviously feel that some people maybe aren't accepting of it. It's definitely good to have that partner or mentor there. Um, And now what we're actually doing with some other people is, we're working with them, like say they want to find some multifamily properties. Mm-hmm. We're kind of sitting on them and I'm now helping them with their presentations to then go in. So they have that expertise in there with them. So I would just say having a mentor or somebody alongside with you, that's more advanced or expertise in the field right. um, can definitely help. And I would, I would always recommend for somebody looking to get into multi have a mentor yeah. or better, even better a partner. So they're involved in the deal. Um, I think it's honestly a necessity. Absolutely. No, I, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, I feel like a lot of us feel the same way. We think, oh, you know what? I'm sure some, someone listening to this is 18 in high school and they probably think, oh, no, I can't do this. I have to wait till I'm older. Yeah, That's not true, right? There's so many things you can absolutely do to get your feet wet. I'm so curious, how did you get that interest so early at that young age? Like 18 year olds don't care about real estate. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I kind of just saw a couple different paths um, for my future. My father worked full time a lot in Toronto. Um, no investments like that, just, you know, worked full time all the time. And I, I quickly saw my mother looking at these real estate op- opportunities, mm-hmm. um, financial freedom, obviously possible through that. And I thought that looks great. I really need to get that in my life and uh, I want to be there. So um, I just kind of saw the benefits of it pretty early. And especially growing up in a small town, not a lot of people really did that. And I was going right. to these rain meetings. Um, you know, I was kind of forcing myself uh, to always meet a few people at each meeting, which was really helped me get out of that, you know, young limiting belief. Um, and yeah. all those people I was meeting were doing really well in their lives and their careers. And they were the, you know, the common theme of that was they're all investing in real estate. I thought, okay. So, you know, at that time I didn't really know that for sure what the benefits are, but um, I could just kind of see a common denominator there and thought that's a good path to go. So I just kind of yeah. stuck with it until I really realized, you know, what the benefits are and, and what you can do with it. 
Yeah, that, that's incredible. I, I love that you got, you found it so early, and that that's the that's the key. Yeah. Not to say you know you can't start today, but they, you know the earlier, of course, the better. As Definitely. you know, the best time to buy real estate was yesterday, so as we know it. So <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> or yeah, last year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, exactly. So I mean, yeah, but like you're saying, you're never too young. I mean, uh, we're still where compared to where I want to be, I'm still pretty early on in my portfolio growth in my career, and. Uh, yeah. You know, it doesn't take a whole lot to kind of set yourself up for retirement with real estate. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to push that retirement date early and earlier, you can buy actively growing and growing. But I mean, yeah. um, it's it's easy to set yourself up uh, for success in the long term. So is that your goal? Like, what what are you doing? Like, what's the end goal for you? What are you, are you trying to retire early? Or what's the plan? It's a great question. Um, <laughs> and I reviewed that actually earlier this year. Um, it's the first year I've, I've gone through a goal setting process, which I mm -hmm. highly recommend. Um, my goal is to essentially grow the multifamily portfolio uh, and real estate portfolio in general with joint venture partners uh, to a point where I've got a, you know, a target net worth goal that I want to reach. Um, okay. And ideally, obviously bringing the joint venture partners along with me and right. everybody growing together. Um, and at that point, just kind of divesting some of the portfolio into private lending, some into the stock market, just kind of spreading it a little bit where I can then live off the passive income. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I probably intend to bring an employee on to run my management firm so I can step back a bit um, right. and then just kind of go into more of a role that I see a lot of guys doing now, which is, you know, private lending, um, having the passive income there, and then also maybe coaching and helping other people do the same thing, because I think there's a lot of value in that as well. Absolutely. It's, it's very rewarding. And, and, and I love that when people get to the certain point in life where they've done it all, they just want to pass on that wisdom. And I think that's basically it gets to that point in life where you just want to, because it feels good and you're making a huge impact in people's lives. So yeah, I love that. As of right now, so you're sitting at a portfolio of how many, how many doors let's just say? Uh, yeah, right now, uh, 24 will be closing on 28, uh, in February. Um, so that's a six unit in Hamilton and a nine unit in Hamilton, um, the six unit in Cambridge and, uh, also my condo and then the properties that I mentioned as well. Perfect. So you still hold on, you've held on to the condo still, right? Eh? Definitely, definitely. The condo has done really well for me in Waterloo. I bought that in uh, in twenty at the end of twenty eighteen. Um, fully renovated that, and uh, I'm actually just pulling some money out of there uh, in the next month or so. It's uh, yeah, I love that condo. It's although I wouldn't really invest in a condo again because, except for when I got in early enough that that was you know it could cash flow. Um, right, it made sense back then. We're really seeing cash flowing right now, but. Mm -hmm. The hands off of a condo is great. So anybody, you know, looking to get in, it might be a feasible option if you can find something that works for that. Um, right. The growth on that is limited, obviously, because you can only re renovate the interior. You don't really have much control of the outside, but it, it is nice uh, in that sense. Um, but yeah, def I'm going to hold that one forever. Um, it's, it's, a nice, <laughs> it's a nice spot in Waterloo and uh, yeah, it does really well. Yeah, no, for sure. The maintenance, right? You don't have to worry about it. You, you pay maintenance costs. You're not, you're not shoveling the driveway. You're not, you're not doing anything. Literally, it's all taken care of. Yeah, my entire uh, my entire checklist for that property every year is December. I send a Christmas card. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so it's pretty it's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. So are you renting to a family or a student or what? What kind of uh, renters do you have? Uh, just a, a lady uh, from the UK actually on her visa. So it's a nice two bedroom apartment. Um, she's working from home though, which works out really well, and she takes care of the place nicely. I was actually in there a couple months ago to just uh, she wanted the old spare bed out so that she could convert the office. So I picked it up and in great shape and yeah so she's really nice takes care of it i actually when i was renting it i had an offer for more money from a couple with a dog mm -hmm. um happy i went the other way because i would say that honestly the 50 bucks a month is not worth redoing those little things um yeah. in a multifamily strategy i wouldn't really go that route because what we're looking at is basically top rents for the end goal the refinance date to put money out we can chat yeah. about that later for the condo um it cash flowed and it's nice so uh, i'm happy with that yeah yeah, and you took a, a HELOC from it, right? Sounds like. Yeah, I'm in the process of actually just completing that right now. Yeah, the right. HELOC's a, a great opportunity. Um, and I know, I think you had talked about this on a, a previous podcast that I really liked is that, so I left school with an OSAP loan mm -hmm. and, you know, I saved up money. I considered paying that off, but instead I bought this condo. Um, that has since, I'm going to be able to refinance that, pay off my OSAP loan. I did buy a truck on a, on a lease when I started my job because I needed a vehicle. I'm also right. going to be able to pay that off. So I think that, uh, I think you recommend that last time is, you know, don't be so quick to pay off that OSAP loon if you can, or, or those other loans, if you can keep it <laughs> and purchase real estate, that's going to make you more money and pay those off. Um, yeah. It's a great opportunity. So there is, you know, there is times when it's good to get rid of the bad debt like that when you can, <laughs> which I'll be looking to do, but um, right. you know, where your, where your, uh, where your, I guess, consequences of that.
Yeah, I know for sure. If you're if you're in a bad financial situation or you have really bad, uh, you know, credit, for example, your credit report is really bad and it's because you have so many debts, it makes sense to pay those off. But I think majority of us who go to school here, we 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 tend to all work on the side anyway. So we are saving up for school and saving up for, for uh, uh, you know, our, our, our loans. So might as well just put that on something that will produce income versus just paying it all off and then what you've saved five percent you could have just made you know 30 percent on that money instead right minimum definitely yeah <laughs> as long as you can find the opportunity for it um yeah. it definitely makes sense to keep it yeah yeah i know for sure for sure yeah. um and then yeah so tell me a little bit about, about how you pick decide to pick a market because you could jump quite a bit right you went from like you said hamilton cambridge and then now you're looking at uh lindsay and obviously you mentioned waterloo right so uh, what are some of the driver fa- uh, driving factors for you to say, you know what, I'm now comfortable to go from a bigger, big market, say, such as Hamilton. Hamilton is now considered a big market, by the way. Yes. <laughs> to like, you know, uh, a smaller markets, like say, uh, Lindsay, Ontario, for instance. Good question. So right out of the gate, when I started learning, I mentioned, you know, Don Campbell's book. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's called The Acre System. Goes through everything you need to really look into when selecting market. At that time, Rain also was putting out market rent reports, uh, their top 10 towns list, things like that. Right. Giving us, because obviously the research can be difficult. Um, if you're trying to do it yourself, you know, you're sitting there looking through stats, can trying to pull the population growth, things like that. It can be difficult. Yeah. Um, Rain also did recommend Hamilton and the, and the good re- the reasons for that were, you know, population, job growth, um, possible LRT, um, ripple effect from Toronto, things like that, that all, you know, are going to push that market up in the, in the long term. Obviously, that is what happened. Um, so we were looking at Hamilton at that time for the few years there. I, I believe it's still like top three on their top 10 towns list. So it's, st- it's still a great opportunity if you yep. can get in there at, you know, at, a, at the proper price. Um, but then also on the top of their list was the KWC market. So a lot of tech jobs in Waterloo, the ion train development was going in. Um, the purchase or the property we purchased in Cambridge is actually about 800 meters away, maybe a kilometer away from a future ion train stop. So, you know, looking at the development plans wow. for these ion trains, um, and just the job growth and, and population growth of Waterloo and Cambridge, um, yep. and Kitchener, um, as well, I mean, really low vacancy rates here, no issues ever re-renting in these properties. So um, going through those, you know, those top towns reports that Rain used to put out, looking at what's happening in the area, those things really led us to both of those markets. Um, and I think those are the most important things to look for when you're looking at. So obviously job growth, employment growth, and, uh, you know, transportation development. Those are, those are the top things there. I think you're absolutely right. Those are the top three. If you have those, you can literally make any market work, right? If you can definitely have a job, have the money and be able to go to your job. That's all it is. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Look at what people need and uh, where would you want to live? Right. So, so. yeah. Yeah. And, and, and as, as we mentioned, as, as prices are going up, people are um, not considering, you know, going further and further and further away because of telecommunicating, right? People working from home. Right. Um, and so it is making it a lot easier. Who knows what's going to happen in the future, but I think as the way it stands, I want to go on record and say this, this is going to be the, the remaining for another year at the very least uh, mm-hmm. before things get uh, you know, back to normal potentially. But even then, I think there's going to be a hybrid. I don't, f- I don't feel any company is going to pull the trigger and say you all need to be in the office unless it's absolutely necessary, depending on yeah, the- Yeah, that's a great point. And um, that kind of leads to, obviously, the ripple effect conversation where, you know, mm-hmm. where are the big cities, where are people getting priced out of and where are they going next? Um, I know a lot of people talk about that. Andrew Hines is one who says, you know, look for areas outside of big towns um, that are basically going to be growing, that are commutable, that have good infrastructure, things like that. That's what kind of made Lindsay a good choice for us. It wasn't the primary reason we went there. Um, We were actively searching so hard for a property uh, that we did end up finding a private seller in Lindsay that's looking to get rid of some really nice um, residential properties at a really good price. you know, he, have, he allowed us to have financing and inspection conditions, flexible closing date, things like that. And all the numbers work. So obviously in the current market, that was a, that was a gold mine for us. So that's the main reason we went to Lindsay, but um, I actually grew up there as well and knowing the area itself. So I know the street these properties are on. I'm happy with the ripple effect that's going there. Pedro's right. getting a little expensive. It's kind of a good spot for that. Um, and with the rents that I'm seeing in the area and the price we got for it, it still made sense. So it was a good opportunity to jump on there. Yeah, no, that, that's an excellent point. And then, uh, we, like I said, we're seeing further and further. And like, I'm seeing a huge flock of people going in the, uh, even north. Sudbury is just becoming the ne- uh, the next Windsor. Windsor was like extremely really? hot. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, all these investors from Windsor are now moving to Sudbury. Like, it's just a flock of investors wow. going in that market. So uh, before this uh, podcast recording, I was I was joking with Jake. I'm like, yeah, those 
realtors are just making a killing because if, if you're an investor-minded realtor in a small town, you're laughing right now because you, you're in such a high demand uh, as people are constantly looking for you know advice and they want to the expertise in the region. So uh, definitely. Uh, yeah, I'm just so curious to see what, what's going to happen in the market. I mean, because I, I'm sure you're seeing this and I'm seeing this. I'm constantly looking at properties, you know, for my clients, for myself and my partners and the numbers just don't add up. Like I, I really, really don't understand, you know, I get it from a seller perspective because they bought low and they're, they were cash flowing, but now they're selling high. But for an investor taking it on, unless you're truly banking on a getting vacant possession or doing something about, you know, raising rent somehow um, and, you know, doing minor renovations, I don't think you can cash flow. Right. So when you're looking at properties in this, and again, this I may be completely wrong, but I have a feeling people are looking at it this way. They're not no longer looking at just cash flow. They're looking at, you know, a five-year plan. They may think, you know what, first year I'm going to get uh, a hit. I may lose, you know, say uh, $10,000, let's just say, but I know I'm going to make that money in appreciation in the year. So yeah. as long as I hold on to it, I'm going to make the money. That's, that's my, my feel about it. What do you think? I, I agree. Um, I think there's a little more where you really want to make sure that you have the plan to obviously have that appreciation that makes up for it, but also a plan to then cash flow in the long term. So Absolutely. all the properties that we've bought, to be honest, have have been negative cash flow from day one. Um, the multifamilies, especially, what we're looking for is under market rents. You know, this sixplex we just bought, average rents were about eight fifty when we purchased. Right. Market rent was around sixteen hundred for these units. So oh, wow. we know that if there's turnover, which you know we budget say over five years, 75% turnover. We know what we can add value. We know how much add value we can add to those properties and it makes sense. So right, right, even right. these properties in Lindsay, um, the duplex we closed on, we know that we can add uh, add value to that in cash flow. say next year in a couple of years, once we have better financing on it, you know, right now we close with some private money in a VTB, it's high rate. Right now we're negative cash flow, but we know that we can hold it until we get to that point that we've renovated you know, we've stabilized and we can cash flow. And as long as you, you have a, a plan in mind for that, um, I think it's a good, a good call. If you're just buying negative cash flow and it's already, you know, at its highest and best use, you're going to be in, you know, you're going to be in some issue there. You're gonna have Bingo. Some there, you, so. you said it perfectly. That's what it is. Right. So that's my point was making it. I was trying to make is that people are seeing that now. I feel like that mindset has shifted a little bit. So people are investors I'm noticing are okay with carrying a negative cash flow. Definitely. They see the turnaround like you said, a tenant leaves who's paying 400 today, market rent is 1400 Boom, that's a $1,000 difference, right? You, you're getting. Yeah. But overall, what I, what I would like to say is like, uh, I, I, again, uh, everybody's different, but I truly still believe you still have to have somewhat of cash flow. You can't just can't have too much of a negative cash flow. In my opinion, if any, just avoid it. Just because interest rates are really low right now, but say things happen tomorrow, what are you going to do in that point, right? Like, I mean, you gotta, you gotta have A, B, and C covered, in my opinion, right? Like have multiple strategies and exit strategies are, I think, very vital. Uh, because especially if you're gonna continue to uh, invest and grow your portfolio and, and you wanna refi, like you, got, you gotta remember, your, your income is also considered, right? How much money is coming in is a huge component of refi, right? So um, I don't know if many people know that, but that's, it's not just the property value itself, but they take in other areas also into consideration. Yeah, I completely agree. And, uh, you know, if you're planning on holding properties long term, which, you know, I am, you have to kind of account for that and, you know, possible rise in rates, even right. more, you know, applicable rise in insurance costs. So insurance oh, yeah. costs for multifamilies <laughs> this year have gone approximately double. Property tax have gone up quite a bit um, and yeah. rents have been allowed to go up zero percent right so that's something you can't really predict those that jump but um you need to make sure that you have a bit of a buffer there and uh like you're saying have at least a bit of cash flow or or be prepared to hold that if that does happen yeah no for sure for sure um and then yeah in terms of just i'm just thinking like in terms of tenant portfolios that you look for right every market is a little bit different so do you find primarily these markets you invested is mainly blue blue colored um would that be a right assumption um, when we've purchased, not so much. So we've purchased in rougher areas, um, especially in Hamilton. A lot of the tenants there have been a little rougher. Um, right. What we're looking to do is basically renovate and, and attract that higher end tenant, especially looking at their life plan. So most people in that stage of life um, are looking to sort of, you know, rent for a bit while they're saving up uh, to then buy a home. So, you know, that, that two to three, three to four year tenant versus right. somebody who's sort of settled in their life, 
they're just looking to settle down, might be there for 30 years, is not really going to allow you to then renovate when needed to then refinance 10 years or 15 years down the road, right? So right, right. Um, when we purchase, not that's not so much the case of the tenant profile, but um, we're definitely renovating for that tenant profile. Um, the other note on that though, is you do want to watch out for some of those tenants when you're buying, not that they're bad, but I just mean, if your plan is to renovate, mm -hmm. um, one thing I've learned uh, from buying this townhouse complex here is that people in townhomes stay quite a bit longer. So I've now right. adjusted my projection for five years instead of, you know, 75% turnover, probably only half of the building here. And I may even have to do some buyouts of those tenants to get them to leave, right? Because those guys are settled. Um, they're not really having as many changes in their lives. So, um, <laughs> but we're definitely renovating for that target market like that, uh, the higher end you say. Yeah, perfect. And then since you are managing right now, right? So uh, what are some best practices you learned for, I guess, tenant screening or tenant profile? I would love to like learn a little bit yeah. about your strategies. So I'm really aggressive on my tenant screening, um, yeah. primarily because I have some really bad tenants and I don't intend to ever have that happen again. Um, yeah. I think uh, my current tenant, one of them I have I, that I have inherited in Hamilton is at about 15 months unpaid rent and oh, wow. we get him out. So and uh, there are some worse ones than that. He's not actually the worst, but I won't go into details. But I'm, I'm really aggressive on our tenants because if you get a good tenant in there, they're going to take care of the place. And when they move out, it's going to look the same. And it's going to save me a lot of money down the road. It's a lot of headaches along the way because there are some tenants who do take good care of the place, but they also are maybe not a good fit for the property. Maybe didn't know that going in, but they still want it. And I'm getting phone calls all the time. So um, mm -hmm. right out of the gate, I have an automatic response questionnaire that I send to tenants that when I get a message on Facebook, Kijiji, that I, that they respond to, um, right. on James for that. I just stole that one from him. Um, so that basically filters out, I would say 70% of the people that aren't really serious about it. If you can't answer a questionnaire, you're likely not really serious in the property. Right. From there, um, if they're qualified based on my, you know, initial qual qual or criteria, mm -hmm. I book a viewing. And the viewing is probably the most important, just gives me an idea of, you know, how that person is, who's going to be moving in there. I make sure that everybody that's going to be living there attends the viewing. So I get a sense of, you know, who they are. Um, are they hiding anybody that's going to move in after the fact that's going to be a problem? Um, right. And then just a standard uh, Facebook credit checks, um, landlord check and uh, employment check, all the, all the standard ones in there. So I do do all the checks. I think some yeah. people think it's a bit overkill, um, but I just don't think you can be too careful to, to avoid getting that 3% of tenants um, that are really, you know, going to cause you a lot of headaches. And my leasing process, I pretty much piggybacked off of Quentin D'Souza's leasing book and uh, recommendations from Kellen James. So thanks to those guys for that. But um, I think doing all your checks is, is really important when you're, when you're getting tenants in. Oh, absolutely. It, it makes or breaks your business. Definitely. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. You, you just, you mentioned all the great points there, right? So somebody who's, who wants to live there, make a living, they're going to treat it as their home where mm -hmm. others are going to treat it as it's not theirs and they're going to just trash the place and they don't care about it. And then unfortunately, especially in a multifamily, as we know it, if you have one bad apple, guess what's going to happen to the rest, right? <laughs> it exactly. just plays over. Yeah. And that's a great point, actually, how they affect your neighbors. So I have yeah. one bad tenant I inherited in a property right now, and I've got two vacant units that we're renovating, but I'm not going to be able to renovate those really until maybe he's out of there. So we're looking at different mm -hmm. options for that, trying to work with him on some buyouts, because um, it really does impact your neighbors when you're in a multifamily building. Um, yeah. And it really brings up or down the, the portfolio of that, of that building overall. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Yeah, for sure. That, that, that's awesome, Jake. Yeah. I, what I want to also ask you is, is uh, we, you know, you've had some phenomenal success so far and you continue to grow, but what are some of your failure stories? I'd love to hear a little bit because success comes with failure. So if you want to share some of those, that'd be great. Definitely. Um, the biggest one for me is I think just trusting. So outsourcing any job really, and just trusting that it will be done to your, I guess, standard or properly or even fairly. So, mm -hmm. um, I won't say who it was. Back when we started, we had management in place. Obviously, okay. the, the the goal for these properties is a value add strategy. Um, that means that if there's ever a, a tenant turnover, we want to know so that we can renovate it, right. up the rents, get a good quality tenant there, and then at the end of the day, when we refinance the property, it really just depends on the income of that property. So we want to get maximum rents. Mm -hmm. um, we just kind of trusted that everything was going well and that we're going to know these. So. When I was in, this was when I was in school and I, you know, I, we had a property manager taking care of everything. Right. Um, we weren't really looking too closely at what was going on. However, since I've taken over, I found that some of the tenants that are in there actually moved in 
during that management that we were not aware of. They were actually put there on a discount to get them out of other properties. So mm-hmm. they actually brought down the, the value of the building. So really right. we're, you know, it, it's, it's rare, especially now to get, you know, natural turnover in Hamilton with such high prices. Right. So right. it's hard to get tenants out. Um, you know, we work with, we work, we work with them how we can with buyouts and whatnot, but it's, it is hard to get turnover. So having, you know, an opportunity to improve that building and having them have just put somebody in there who was going to actually bring it down. That was, that was a big failure on my part um, to not really manage that closely enough to know mm-hmm. that. Um, right. The more recent managers that we have have been, have been great. Um, but that's kind of the reason I took over is just to keep a closer eye on things. And I would just definitely recommend every part of the business that you're going to be doing, you maybe don't have to be the expert at or, or do it every time, but at least do it once or learn the ropes so that you know what to look for in that you're kind of keeping a tab, keeping tabs on things and it's done to your standards so that, you know, the project is going how you plan it to go. Cause you know, yeah. that might not always be the case. Yeah, no, absolutely right. That's right. And yeah, be, be very careful with, with property managers. I'm not trying to say, you know, give them a bad word for it. Everybody's different, but I've seen this firsthand where, um, you know, say that I had a bad tenant we were trying to get out of, right? And uh, I've seen them kind of, you know, say, you know what, don't worry about it. I'll give them a good reference if someone else calls. So be careful, very, be very careful with references. Yes. Because it could be a, you don't know who who is on the other side of the phone. It could be, a, you know, a friend pretending to be someone or B, it could be, yes, uh, an existing landlord, but he, his objective is to get rid of that tenant. So he's going to give you all the good stories about this person and mm-hmm. hide the rest. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a fair assessment you have to make even with those screening process. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, I always try to call two past landlords if I can for that exact reason. It doesn't always work out because, you know, people maybe moved out of home or something like that before, but right, right, right. you can um, screen that. And then one other thing, I guess, on that note, just to kind of get the word out is I have signed up for Landlord Credit Bureau, um, if you're not aware. So that's a way that you can report bad tenants as well as good tenants to the credit bureau to help or hurt their credit scores. Um, and I'm now doing my credit or my tenant screening in there as well to, uh, or I'm going to be to make sure that, you know, um, they've been screened by a landlord who obviously, you know, cares. Talk to me a little bit about uh, your management. I'm glad you brought that point up. So um, are you, what kind of software are you using now to keep tabs? Because it's quite a bit of units, right? Like how are you managing this? Yeah, I'm at around 50 units right now. So it it can be a little hectic. Um, Definitely get your systems and software in place. If you're taking on a lot of properties, Um, Mm -hmm. I use Buildium personally. So it takes in all the rents right into the bank account, records them all, creates it in the report. So it tracks most of the income through there. I track most of the expenses and utilities, things like that. So it does a lot of that work for me, which is nice. Um, It allows tenants to go in and see their account balances, things like that. So um, that's great software for, for collecting rents. And that's, that's probably the primary one that I would need. Um, other little things like uh, Doc Hub and things like that to make my life easier. But um, Buildium or or some sort of electronic payment system um, yeah. is needed. So I, I only collect actually one rent check every month uh, that goes to a deposit box app in Hamilton. Other than that, everything's either e-transfer or through Buildium. So um, highly recommend trying to go electronic if you can. Yeah. So roughly speaking, let's just say, let's put it in perspective. How, how many hours are you spending a week kind of just property managing so far? So that's a good question. Um, I would say if you were, so for an average property manager, you could probably get away with say 10 hours a week to do all the required things. Um, I'm more or less taking a proactive management stance right now where I'm, I'm really doing, you know, entire portfolio management, trying to improve these properties more than an average manager would because it's my own and I want to do well. So I'm putting in, you know, more like 20, 20 to 30 on average as well as some additional stuff, but that's just more or less me trying to improve these properties on my own and uh, make right. it better. And then the rest of my time is spent um, just working on my own business, uh, trying to improve my side of things as well as I do a lot. Of, I mean, I still do a lot of the hands-on stuff um, if it makes sense. Um, and I like to as well. So um, I just kind of split the rest of my time, however I need maybe going on podcasts. Uh, but as for the management, you know, I can get away with sort of like half my week for, for management stuff. Um, right. Even less than that for the, I'd say for the bare minimum of things. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, you are also, as you mentioned, you're pretty active on the acquisition side. So I'm assuming that takes a lot of your time as well, looking for deals, analyzing, trying to get, uh, you know, offers in and so forth. Yeah, it could be very time consuming, believe it or not. As a realtor, I would tell you that it, it looks easy, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, you have to gather. And then especially if you're competing on the market. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and um, 
maybe it's not quite the case now. I mean, with people not doing, you know, inspections or finance conditions, but mm-hmm. when we're buying a multifamily property, that's all, you know, it's a long process for us and there's a yeah. lot of work involved there. So when that does come up, um, it's nice to have those systems in place so that I can dedicate the time to that when I need to. So, yeah. So do you mind Jake sharing with us one of the projects that you handled? Uh, let's talk a little bit numbers. I would love to uh, give our viewers, you know, some information and get, give them some numbers. So Tell us, you know, uh, one that you purchased, how much you purchased for and so forth. Yeah, for sure. So uh, our most recent multifamily property, we're about a year into the project. So I can give, you know, a closing summary where we're at now and where we kind of plan to be with some numbers. Sure. So um, it's a sixplex, it's a t- uh, sixplex of townhomes in Cambridge, purchased mm-hmm. for $1.12 million back in 2019. Mm-hmm. Uh, our first mortgage was around seven sixty. With closing costs, about 113,000 renovation estimate, um, put the investment investment required around 525. Um, so that's the closing numbers. So our JV was around 525 basically to get this property. Um, right. When we purchased the property, average rents were around 850 bucks. As it stood at that time, average rents were around 1600 to 1800. Since then, we've seen them go even higher. Mm-hmm. Now that's essentially with only cosmetic renovations for the most part. We're looking at changing the heating in some units, but um, for the most part, only cosmetic re- renovations. Two of them are actually finished. So our, our CapEx and our renovations are gonna be relatively low. We budgeted about 120,000 for all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, when we closed, as I mentioned before, we weren't really right. cash flowing. So our effective gross rents were around 58,000. Okay. Our operating expenses were around 22,000 annually. And our uh, our debt servicing was around thirty six five, so we were still a little negative on cash flow at that time. Our repairs and maintenance are also a little bit higher because it's been neglected for quite some time. Mm-hmm. A lot of little things came up in the first year. Yeah. Um, looking at after one year, so we've renovated one unit that was vacant on closing. We put around twenty thousand dollars in renovations, and the rent increase on that unit was around seven hundred and fifty dollars a month. So. We actually did get an appraisal after the first year for for banking uh, purposes, and uh, right. the appraisal came in around one point two six. So our value went up around one hundred forty thousand dollars in the first year, and mm-hmm. based on that investment required, it's about a twenty six percent return. Okay. Um, so we look at about one hundred forty thousand dollars from that first year. Right. After that first year, we're actually cash flowing about four hundred dollars a month. Um, our rents went up 750, but as I mentioned before, insurance has gone up quite a bit. Our property yeah, taxes yeah. went up a little bit, so things like that. The nice thing with this property is we actually don't pay any utilities, so water, heat, hydro, everything is paid by the tenants because they're sort of isolated townhomes. So that's um, something Beautiful. that'll never really increase for us, which helps a lot for this property. For sure. Um, yeah. So right now, out of year, about year one, we're up about 140,000 equity. We spent about 20 on renovations, mm-hmm. um, and we're cash flowing a little bit. Our five-year plan for this is to basically have two more turnovers. So I mentioned before, we budget sort of 75% of the units to turn over within yeah. five years. As I mentioned, these are townhomes, so I'm seeing it already be a bit slower. We're going to start offering buyouts soon. Um, so we're estimating if we turn over two more units, um, the valuation at that time should be about 1.87 is what we've run the numbers at. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we're going to refinance at that time. That's the five-year plan to always refinance. Okay. Um we can't quite refinance 85% of the value because our debt coverage ratio, um, we can go into more on that later, but essentially we're looking at uh, pulling all the investor capital back out. So 525 for the investors, right. as well as an additional hundred thousand dollars in uh, in a surplus. So that'll be distributed to all shareholders. So at that time, everybody has their money back out of the property. So mm-hmm. no money down plus some, um, and the average annual ROI on that is around 26% if we're getting that, uh, that valuation. With that new mortgage, our cash flow really isn't too high. We're around five hundred dollars a month because the the mortgage and the financing expenses are obviously right. much. Um, yeah. But you know, we all still own this property, and there'll be about a, a half a million in equity left in that property. So um, I know that the cash flow numbers are nice to look at. They're not really as as exciting in this project because I know a sixplex that only cash flows maybe five hundred bucks a month isn't the most exciting. Um, but at the end of the day, all of our investors are getting their capital back plus yeah. some. Um, and we've still got about 500,000 equity in the property and we're just going to keep holding it long-term. And obviously that's only with three turnovers out of six. Mm -hmm. Um, So whether it be in that five-year span or say the next few years after that, um, eventually those other units will turn over and we'll just kind of repeat the process and do that as well. Yeah, no, I I love that. Like I said, that's, that's one of the things that I'm noticing. And I think that a lot of investors should be looking at because you, you have to, um, I guess, go with the flow in the market and because things change all the time, right? So I'm finding that cash flow is becoming 
almost obsolete now, especially it was happening in the market. So I think a good perspective to think about is just like you said, is like long term. Like if again, if you are a buy hold strategy person, think long term. Like yes, uh, don't just strictly just bank on appreciation, but like you can force appreciation. You can raise market rents, right? Like turnovers and these things, like you mentioned, were great ways of kind of pushing that uh, market value, increasing cash flow, whether it's you know pulling the money out and whatnot. So. I love that, Jake. Like um, that's something that I've been talking to about for for quite some time, but it didn't, didn't necessarily had an actual case study. So I think this is going to be very helpful for folks listening in. Definitely, yeah, happy to share. And I know there's a lot of debate. Obviously, um, Mark Lothar talks a lot about this cash flow versus equity investors. So, mm-hmm. um, in my, my current situation, you know, I'm not looking for cash flow. I'm basically trying to build wealth for me and my investors for the long term. Right, right. Basically, just repeat, take this money, repeat this process, and keep building our net worth and equity. For long-term generational growth pretty much so um i really don't need that cash flow our investors don't need that cash flow we're basically just going to be building equity over the next number of years and we're just going to take this money buy another building and just keep doing it so equity investment is really where i'm headed um some people are cash flow but obviously in the in the current market you know you got to kind of do what works and uh this is what's working for us yeah no for sure for sure and just to clarify for anybody maybe listening uh commercial meaning still residential units but six units and up um correct Still residential. So yeah, the, the financing is typically, you know, uh, like you mentioned, 35%. We have gone CMHC in the past. This deal actually is CMHC insured. So we have lower down payment. Mm-hmm. However, we're locked into, into a five-year plan for that. So what we're actually looking at to try and get money out sooner than five years is, is going conventional down the road. Um, okay. Yeah. So obviously uh, higher capital requirements for any multifamily purchase, you know, you're going to need at least Three or four, thirty percent down, maybe thirty-five percent down for what I'd budget. Um, but in the long run, I think you, there's way more money to be made, and uh, and it's just more predictable um, and and easier to really know what you're getting into and and to deal with. So, no, absolutely, absolutely. And then, so what's the minimum requirement for for a commercial, like on the on the on the cap cap rate that they look for? You said it, it was about three percent or four so percent. Depends on the when you're purchasing deal. it. Well, I mean, that's a it's a long discussion. Um, like in okay. the say in the more rural markets, um, if you're looking for cash flow, those are still like around like six or seven percent. Right. In like the Hamilton and more expensive markets, right now people are paying under four percent. However, it might not really make sense unless you know that you can really get a higher return on those rents. Um, it right. might. It's the more that just means you're pay, you're overpaying for the property basically. So you have to know that you're gonna be able to get the money back out of it. So right, I mean, right. The banks are looking at properties around four and a half at five percent. If you can find something like that, it's likely you know comparable to the bank's lending, which means it's a good deal. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're if you're doing a value add strategy, you're likely going to be under overpaying though and, and getting a lower cap rate because those rents are so low. So it's right, right. kind of a it's kind of a toss up. But um, so I mean, I would definitely you know research about cap rates and uh, if you're looking to get involved in, and just kind of understand what they mean and uh, and and why some of them are lower than others and and what you can do with them basically. Yeah, for sure. How, and how does it work on the on the refi side and on a commercial, right? Like on residential, they give you eighty percent to loan to value. How does that work on commercial? What is it similar? Or is it different? Yeah, so the the banks essentially takes your income, your net operating income. They take their estimated cap rate for that area. So say it's four and a half percent. You divide your net operating co- income by that cap rate. They're going to get a valuation. If that valuation that they get is over eighty percent, they'll obviously cut it back to eighty mm-hmm. percent. And if it's under the debt coverage ratio they'll bump it down as well. So essentially they'll take the valuation as long as it meets their LTV and debt coverage ratio criteria, they'll give it to you, but then they'll just basically bring that valuation down or they'll bring the loan that they'll give you down until your debt coverage ratio or LTV or meet their criteria. So. Right. Right. So I guess every credit unit is a little different. They have different criteria such like the banks do. Yeah. They're all relatively similar, but I found that some of them are they all use slightly different numbers in their estimates. So some of them are using your net operating net operating income, but different, say, superintendent fees or something like that to, for their estimates. So right, um, right. they'll all maybe be a little bit different. So uh, we're actually looking to refinance this year and we're kind of looking at different lenders because one is being a little more difficult to work with. Um, right. We'll definitely shop around a bit, but for the most part, they're all kind of relatively on the same page for that. Are you planning now to, uh, how are you going to find deals moving forward? I'm just curious because like, that's one of the things we're all struggling right now. We can't find deals. Yeah, I know you, you hit you found one good uh, seller, for instance. So, are you doing any anything else actively right now to I guess address more of that? So, 
For actively searching, um, the only thing I'm going to be actively searching for moving forward is multifamily. Um, mm -hmm. The residential purchases came up and, and they make a lot of sense now. Um, but for multifamilies, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be changing my structure as well. Um, primarily reaching out to, uh, to brokers or realtors that have off-market listings, really get in touch with them, um, try and get a good relationship there and, and basically see what comes their way and, and have them you know, ready to send them to you if it's something that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, but it is going to be a challenge, I think. So yeah, probably yeah. just being being able to act fast and uh, and get offers out when you see something good, that would probably be the most important. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm comfortable yet going without a financing or inspection clause. So it's going to be even more difficult, but I just need that for, you know, for my investors and for my, you know, safety net um, to make sure, sure that we're getting a good deal. So it's going to be difficult. Um, but I think just, you know, going a lot of different routes, whether it be looking at wholesaler lists, um, realtors with off market deals. I think as long as you're honest with the people you're working with that, you know, I am looking elsewhere as well, but if you send me a good deal, I will close on it. Um, that's all you got to do. And I think that's, you know, that's respectable. And I think that's probably what uh, the approach I'll be taking. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and and the, the reason why I asked that question is because I'm seeing also a lot of uh, investors looking outside of Ontario. Have you considered outside of Ontario or are you primarily just going to hone on, you know, where you are right now? I'm going to stick with Ontario for now. I'm definitely looking into other markets and, and trying to learn about it, but um, I don't have the, you know, the strengths there yet. Um, I'm, it's going to happen eventually. Right. I'm definitely going to get into the international vacation market eventually to get some Airbnbs. That's, nice. that's a small goal I have for, uh, you know, for another day. But um, <laughs> as of right now, you know, my strength is in Ontario, whether it be a little further drive, that might be the, you know, the price I have to pay for now. But um, I want to keep everything kind of in one place as best I can for now. So that, that brings me to, I guess, uh, end of our, our, our podcast, usually what I, I like the segment is, is to learn a bit, a bit more about you and your, your life personally. So, um, you know, you mentioned some great things, some, some great books earlier, right? So for some of the folks that are looking to either, um, polish their skills or learn some of the new strategies or learn about real estate investing, what would you recommend? Let's say top three. Top three. So Don Campbell's books in general is one. Um, he has a ton of great books, really good at, you know, what to look for in the market and, you know, how to invest in Ontario real estate, Canada real estate. So that's right. one. Uh, Quentin D'Souza has a couple of great books. One is the property management toolbox that basically helped me get started. It has everything you want to know about management, um, you know, maintaining properties, maintenance, tenants, leasing, everything. So really practical advice. Um, I'd highly recommend that. And one last one I just recently read, I'll, I'll throw it there, is Fix and Flip from Mark Loeffler and Ian Zabo. Um, really great book of looking at flipping. Um, and the thing I liked about it is just talking about different exit strategies because, you know, the Burr method is really a flip in a sense. So right. um, I'm not really getting into flipping, but I think it had some great ideas about how to look at different exit strategies and what to really think about in, uh, when getting into it. So obviously, we can't travel right now, Jake, but if we could travel anywhere right now in the world, where would it be and why? I wouldn't mind going uh, going to Europe and traveling around there. I went once when I was younger and uh, my girlfriend really wants to go and just, you know, uh, backpack and travel around and, and sightsee. So I think that'd be a great long trip around there um, when things open back up again. So that'd be fun for me. I prefer the more uh, adventure style travel versus the, I guess, vacation uh, relaxed style. So something like that would be great. Yeah. Where exactly in Europe? Any particular starting point? Uh, she wants to go to Spain. So I think we'll be heading there. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Perfect. Yeah. No, Spain's beautiful. Been there. Spain, oh, okay. Portugal. Yeah. That's, that's, there you a, go. that's a trip on his own. <laughs> Get your itinerary then when we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We'd love to share. Any, any last piece of uh, wisdom for, for uh, investors listening in? Yeah. So uh, my biggest piece of advice would just be uh, pick a niche and, and master it and stick with it. So there's um, I know Quentin D'Souza mentioned the shiny object syndrome of so many things in the market right now, like wholesaling is big, um, flips is big for active income, things like that. I myself have thought about it and really want to get into it because, you know, I, who doesn't want to make a lot of money, but um, I've, I've picked a niche in multifamily. I'm sticking with it. I, you know, I write out a business model for what you're doing. I have like a, a 13 page document that's just for me of what my, what my property looks like, what my tenant looks like, all the things I'm looking for. So I know exactly the deal I'm looking for. Um, and that makes it a lot easier when you're discussing it with joint venture partners and other people to say, you know, this is what I'm doing. They have questions, you know, the right. answer. So you're, you're, you know, you're a pro and expert in that field. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's important if you're getting started, you know, uh, things like duplex conversions, for example, I got tempted to do last year. I don't really know it that well, so I've decided not to go there yet. So pick right. something, stick with it, master it, and um, and then go from there. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I'd, I'd recommend. 
just thanks for having me. Um, if you want to reach out to me on Instagram, Jake H. Novis, I'm happy to, you know, chat anytime about my strategy or if anybody wants any help or anything, just, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out and chat anytime. Absolutely. We'll definitely have your links in the show notes and yeah, uh, feel free to connect with Jake and, uh, pick his brain. We'd love to, uh, connect with uh, like-minded folks. Like, so it will be a great opportunity for whoever it is to, to reach out and ask questions. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. I hope you were able to get some great golden nuggets out of it. The kindest thing that you can do is share this podcast across all social media to help as many people as possible. If you like this podcast or have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram or YouTube. I love bouncing ideas, people, and I love talking real estate. Thanks so much. I'll see you in the next episode. Remember, financial freedom is just a few properties away. Oh,